Hmm. Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversants are James Lindsay and Logan Lansing, who have together written a book titled The Queering of the American Child, How a New School Religion Cult Poisons the Healthy Minds and Bodies of Normal Kids. And in that book, they give an overview of the mechanisms of this thing called queer theory that is responsible or the philosophical grounding for which children are being introduced across America to more and more radical gender identity ideologies. That is also the content of this conversation where we talk about queer theory and its impacts and how these toxic ideas are being promulgated through education and media and entertainment. The Queering of the American Child is a fabulous book. I've read it myself, and it can be found on Amazon right now. Links to which are down there in the description. Also, follow Logan and James on Twitter if you so desire. Without further ado, here is James Lindsay and Logan Lansing. What's the content of your connection with this Mr. Lindsay here? Well, I was following him on uh, Twitter. I, I mean, I first learned about you, James, through the grievance studies affair, which I think I've told you. And I thought that was absolutely insane. I was like, I got to follow this guy and Peter and Helen. Um, so I started following him on Twitter and started following the New Discourses podcast. And eventually, when I decided to write this book, I thought I better get someone's outside opinion on whether or not this is <laughs> decent at all. And because of James's expertise, I I sent it to him and asked him if he could look it over. And uh, he graciously did, because I, I think if you remember, James, when I sent it to you, you said, this is the busiest time of my life. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get to it. And I was like, well, there goes that. He's probably not going to get to read it, which is fine. Um, but then he did read it. So it all worked yeah. out. Yeah. Um, you sent it to me right in this kind of weird thing I had from like August through mid-November that was out of control which the very last of those trips, I actually went out and got lunch with Benjamin and his lovely wife and actually told him quite a lot, very enthusiastically about uh, this project. And so he had kind yeah. of the back door vision of it, but yeah, I was crazy busy. So I basically made the, when I'm busy, I have to make this kind of decision. Either I read it right now or I'm never going to read it. And so I happened to be getting on a plane not long after, or maybe when you sent it, I think I might've been on a plane and I was just like, let's just open it and see. And then it turns out that it was quite the page turner. I found it hard to stop reading it once I started reading it. Yeah. And that's always great to hear because when you, when, when you write a book, you have no clue what anyone's going to think about it. I mean, you're the only one invested in it. And at some point it drives you crazy because you're so lost in the thick of it. You're thinking, I don't, is this going to make sense to anyone? So when someone picks it up and says, yes, this does make sense. And it's actually really good. It's a, uh, it's a good feeling. James, yeah, so I remember at one point we were uh, going through critical race theory together. Or you were shop work, workshopping me through it. We, our first conversation was about postmodernism generally, and a lot of your early work when you kind of you guys came out, uh, you and Helen and Peter came out uh, or were exposed was about intersectionality and just the theory of it. You guys spent a lot of time on the theory, and then when the summer of Floyd happened, you really committed yourself to CRT. And well, it was before that, really. Um, but yeah, go ahead. I hear the there. finish of your thought. Well, I just remember at some point you're like, should I should I stop? Should I put down CRT and do a queer theory or this other thing? You're you're thinking about there's two other uh, things that you needed to map and tell people about, and you're like, is it is it the queer theory, or is it this other thing? I don't remember what the other thing is, but um, the queer theory stuff is a part of your entire critique, and so Logan's book fits right in and it extends and builds on like almost like a Lego, like all the stuff that you've been groundworking. Right. So, I mean, the long, the long and short of this history for me was that, you know, we got dragged into what became the grievance studies affair through gender studies. So that was kind of our first, well, and feminism. So that was really kind of our first, um, touch into the woke world in both seeing it put into practice and in diving into the theory. It was originally the grievance studies project was meant just to target gender studies itself, then expanded into, you know, kind of the entire intersectional pantheon as we realized that there are, they've lined them up to be all interconnected. 
we finished the grievance studies affair and Helen had already wanted to expose woke scholarship as, um, as a postmodern. So she had actually started this book. I had agreed to help and edit the book, but I wasn't going to be that involved. It was going to be her thing. And then we decided through the process that what we needed to do was not focus on the grievance studies at all or ourselves at all, but tell the world what we learned about this kind of intersectional hydra. And so, you know, chapter three is post-colonial theory, chapter four is queer theory, chapter five is critical race theory. So we're writing this book. I go in through 2000, all of 19, we're trying to figure out how to build what became new discourses. Is Peter going to be involved? Is Helen going to be involved? Is Mike Nana going to be involved? Is not? And it turned out we all kind of went our separate directions, which I think was the correct thing to do. And so late 2019, I decided I was going to write the Encyclopedia of Social Justice Terminology as a backbone for that project instead of just being another media site. And I thought, where in the world do I start? And I worked my way through a bunch of, you know, basically conversations with myself and realized yeah. critical race theory is the most accessible. It's also the one that's kind of hitting the media the most. So there was some kind of an energy there. Um, and it was also this, uh, it had this, this disgusting quality to it where it's white, this white, that white, this white, that this feels very racist to like normal people. So I thought that would be very clear, but I had that and queer theory was the other one. It was like, do I go, which way do I go? And to be honest with you, I didn't want to study queer theory. I don't like reading queer theory. I in fact, hate <laughs> reading queer theory. Wait, which do you hate most though? Is the queer theory of all the well, postmodern stuff? It's no, the, the hardest thing is at the time I wasn't ready to read queer theory. I could read critical race theory because it was much more clear. Um, it was, it came out of the American legal tradition. So it's written by primarily American lawyers in the first instance. And everything falls falls from there. And lawyers in general, when they're not writing legalese, tend to be very clear writers. It's actually not hard to pick up what they're laying down. Queer theory, on the other hand, is just this humongous mess of weird terminology and like made up words and very postmodern, deconstructive, playful word games. I wasn't I wasn't ready to really pick it apart. I couldn't sit down and read Judith Butler or anything like that and really have a, a great deal of understanding of what she was doing without kind of leaning on Helen. And so I didn't want to go into that, but I also called my business partner at, at New Discourses as my, uh, Michael Fallon, and I had a conversation with him about it. I said, I think I should go into CRT, not queer theory, specifically because um, race is big. But and as, as what I said, this was, I guess, October, maybe 2019, is the second they go publicly full blast into queer theory, they shoot themselves in the foot and we win. That was the yeah. way that it's so objectionable. It's going to create such a reaction. And then they started to do that. You know, well, I, I'd been writing CRT for eight months or thereabouts. George Floyd died. And then all of a sudden I had built this library of explanation yep. for what in the world the interpretation was and what was happening. So that blew up, which was very convenient. I also ended up on Rogan immediately, which was very convenient. And, you know, the book came out right after that, which was very convenient uh, timing for everything. And then finally I got veered off into, you know, I've done more than enough on CRT by the beginning of like 2021 at the, at the very latest, maybe before that I was giving talks, public talks saying, guys, CRT is the lock pick. It's what's behind it. When the door is open, that's way worse. Queer theories coming, uh, you know, post-colonial theories coming. These are much okay. worse. Yeah. And so people just, all they wanted to hear was CRT. I got fed up. I did what I thought was the seminar in 21, July of 21, that became race Marxism and writing, but the videos are out there. I, I said at the time, this is the last word I want to say about CRT. And so I finished race Marxism, published it, and I didn't want to talk about CRT ever again. It's all anybody wanted to hear for like two more years, but I just kept yep. talking about whatever I wanted. I veered into education because I knew that woke fomented in education. The, I, the first time I read Paulo Freire properly, I called Helen, actually. We were still talking regularly. And I said, this guy's a missing link. It all happened in education. It's, the whole thing bubbled out of education. And so I spent, I, I, th I said I was going to do a flyby of education. I got sucked into the gravity of it. It's like trying to do a flyby of like the biggest star in the galaxy. You don't, it's a black hole. You can't get away from it. And so I, I did that. Mark's vacation came out and I'm, Queer theory was blowing up publicly and politically 
But I felt like I was watching the scientists argue about biology and it's like, nobody, they, they don't care about science guys. This isn't like, this isn't the argument. Yeah. And then finally I was like talking about it, but mostly just on Twitter, a little bit in the podcast, I did the groomer schools podcasts. Um, and then yeah. luckily Logan decided to throw this book in my lap. And what, when I read it on the, the plane, uh, the first thing I thought was, this is the book I would have wrote about it if I had taken the time to write it, but better than I could write it. So, um, that well, was it, it's extremely convenient that it that it comes out that way that we can explain queer theory in an accessible way and that I didn't have to sit down because I would have wrote a weird book about this stuff if I sat down and wrote it. Yeah. So uh, Logan, what James is saying about how confusing it is and postmodern it is and how to wrap your head around it, how can something so messy, so illogical be something at all to be worried about? Like why is this – mutinous academic uh, garbage so powerful when it hits the schools and why is it dangerous um that's a great question and and like james alluded to it's a it's one you could spend a lot of time talking about and that's one of the reasons i wrote this book you know i'm a parent and uh, i've always had this nagging question starting in probably 2016, I started to notice a lot of this stuff bubbling up just in my personal life. And I've got a college education. And I was like, you know, I've seen some of this weird stuff at the universities, but now this is bubbling into people I know their workplaces, and it's bubbling into family conversations. And people are talking about absolutely insane ideas, like the idea that sex itself is a social construct, like the idea that there's a spectrum of sex, and it's not just male and female and people can literally become a male or a female if they were born the opposite sex and i was thinking what in the heck is going on i i wasn't too motivated to look into it any further because like james said queer theory is hell reading it is absolute torture uh the months <laughs> and months i had to spend digging through this garbage almost, <laughs> it almost ruined me um but i had to do it because i had children and I was thinking, uh, it, w when James says it's in education, it is so, it's got its hands, its grip so thoroughly around education's neck that it's completely directing the education of our children. And I think people don't realize this. It's, it sometimes astonishes me that people can look and see that their children's school is, is talking to their kids about the fact that their kid has an in inherent gender identity or that uh, just because they were born a male, they might be a female and not think to themselves, where does this come from? That was the yeah. nagging question I had. I am now a parent. I've got to figure this stuff out because I plan on sending my kids through the educational system Well, I did at the time. And I've got to wrap my head around this. And I, I think the reason it's so powerful is because the, the people in this cult, it is a cult, uh, have complete what's called milieu control in society. They have captured, they have taken this ideology and ransacked all of our institutions and now it's yeah. raining back down on our heads so when someone goes to ask questions about what sex and gender and sexuality mean anymore they're hearing it from these captured institutions which is very powerful because they're looking to experts to explain it to them because the cult is very good at controlling the social milieu and convincing people that they need an expert to explain these things to them and everywhere they look it's being reinforced uh, so that I think that's why it's it's uh. so powerful. And how either of you? Uh, so James, you brought up Freire, uh, who was the uh, Marxist educator. He he, he spoke a lot about um, how to apply this to education to the youth. So how did this particular set of ideas, the queer ideas, we can think of it as a cult. You can also think of it as an infection. Like, how does it cling to the people specifically in education, entertainment, and uh, like just media kind of things? The, the the matrix building kind of people seem to be inf or the ones who have been infected by it. Is there something about how it latches onto their minds? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to answer this, and I'd be interested to see what Logan says about it. But uh, just to add to what Logan said, how has this been so effective? I'll point out that queer theory is not very effective on adults. It's really not. It has like kind of two inroads on adults. One of those is the the they they're playing off of the fear of 
uh, that, that was inculcated in people largely through the 80s and 90s of the non-inclusive parent, the parent who would disown their gay child. And there's this kind of virtue signaling aspect to parenting where I would never be the kind of parent who would do that. And even that touches into people who don't have children. They don't have any the slightest um, idea of what it's like to raise a kid. They can still uh, pretend to imagine themselves as a parent and they're, oh, I would be so inclusive. So they get really, really desperate to push the the queer theory ideas because they they're virtue signaling that they're the most inclusive potential or actual parents in the world. The second way that it makes it into adults is through their children specifically. All of a sudden somebody in the family, a niece, a nephew, a son, a daughter, something decides they've adopted a queer identity and now you have to be an ally, you've got to be affirming, you've got to be supportive, you have no idea what to do with this because it's literally outside the realm of reality. You're caught in this weird position and you see this actually kind of very commonly. The On the other hand, and this is part of why it kind of segues into the question you're asking, queer theory is very, very appealing to children. Lots of bright colors, lots of fantasy, lots of pretend. They don't have a solid formation of identity, and that's what queer theory is doing is it's hijacking identity formation yeah. when it comes into education. And you, can, you can't mislead a grown man except through some kind of a weird perversion to believe that he can be a woman. You can very easily convince a little boy that he can be a girl. They believe in Santa Claus. They believe in all kinds of fantastic things. You can tell them the most ridiculous explanation. We, I mean, I, everybody I know that's dealt with little kids, especially if they were a teenager and had a very young you know, brother or cousin or something, has this story where the the young four or five, six-year-old wanted to go swimming or something, and you start telling them about the invisible sharks that live in the water, so if you go in, you'll die. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, there's totally invisible sharks in the lake. They'll never get in the lake in their, in their lives again because they're terrified of invisible sharks. And they'll believe this crap because they're little kids and they they do not have adult brains. They have not gone through the process of identity formation. And so they're part of the reason that it's appealing is there's this intrinsic narcissism of youth and queer theory is insanely narcissistic and it plays to fantasy and it plays to transformation and it plays to the whole ability to focus relentlessly on who am I, who am I, who am I? It's like Myers-Briggs times a bajillion. It's yep. the the most like cut and dry, like what's my secret super duper extra personality type that describes who I really am. And you get to have your whole profile on your social media or whatever, that you're a demi this and a, you know, pan that and a try this and the other thing that. And you're, it, it's literally the same, oh, I'm a Gemini with lunar rising. It's all of this same obsessive search for self that it's hijacking in young people and the narcissism of adolescents in particular with all of the added um, natural identity formation destabilization that's going on through puberty that it's tapping into and stealing these most vulnerable kids into what, what amounts to a cult. But that also partly explains why it's so prevalent in education, so prevalent in media, so prevalent in entertainment. Also, though, we basically sacrificed those domains to the left. Conservatives just said, well, that's leftist. I don't believe in public education. I'm out. Art is gay. The gay people can all have it. Like that was literally like a conservative mindset. Art, that's gay. So guess who filled art? LGBTQ people who were uh, disproportionately filled with activists who had these grievances, some of whom might have had yeah. other agendas. And so you find this pouring into those fields. I don't know if it's something in their their brain, they're more creative, whatever. There is probably some degree of that. Um, yeah. they're, they tend to be more socially Psychological liberal profiles. to libertine when they're in the artistic realm. Teachers don't skew that way. But the critical pedagogy model where what the teacher becomes in the critical pedagogy model, which follows from Paulo Freire, is specifically teacher as, as, as liberator. Teacher is liberator of the child from the oppressive system he's having to grow up in. And there has been the, the leftward lurch of education schools since the 1980s is just unbelievable. In fact, so much so that Isaac Gottesman brags that by 1992, Paulo Freire was the gold standard everywhere. That's his word for it, everywhere in education. So they're already in this deep leftist milieu, which is excluding and pressing out and alienating con potential conservative teachers. 
And they're going to be very warm to this idea of the liberatory potential of queer theory because they're leftists. And so there are lots of forces in different domains that went into it. With art, it's I think that basically the arts got largely taken over by by queers who became queer activists. And the um, the education, it was completely a leftist milieu, controlled milieu by the 90s. And queer theory just started seeping in immediately. These people that are that are hell bent on pushing queer theory understand viscerally that there is a there's a timer on them getting queer theory into people's heads. TikTok, puberty's over. They know who they are. They're not going queer. So by the end of college, at the latest, you've basically lost your opportunity to bend somebody. So of course they're going to drive into um, education. It's the same mentality with the puberty blocker thing. Puberty blockers have to be used before puberty or else all these harms, blah, blah, blah. That's the narrative, right? Well, yeah, because puberty changes your body physically. It also turns out to change your brain physically. You actually grow up mentally and physically and physiologically or neurologically. And so they have to try to get in before that happens. You can do that psychologically with way less objection than you can chemically or, or medically or surgically uh, yeah. from parents. And so it's just this kind of perfect domain. Queer theory um, was originally designed by people who were predominantly sex positive, radical feminist lesbians who, but although there were other, there were men involved as well, which were these kind of very, um, you know, uh, nonconformist gay men and in some of whom, like Michel Foucault, had severe pathological issues, pedophilia, BDSM, violence, sadism, like it's bad, and that we're trying to rationalize the pathologies. But it became very apparent that if you take this up as a mode of liberatory potential, that the people you have to liberate most and earliest before society can socialize and script onto them who they're going to have to be are going to be children. Because, I mean, Logan talks about this brilliantly in the book. That's their idea is that society scripts onto you who you have to be. Then you're imprisoned by the script society wrote. So you have to get ahead of the scripting. You've got to get in there before they're scripted. Hence, you see stuff like neonatal queer theory now where they're trying to use uh, – literally, I saw a thing on the, the yesterday or the day before where they're using sonograms to determine if your child is queer in the womb. Like that's this insane. This is a Harvard uh... – this is Probably Harvard, at Harvard, right? which is yeah, this is some Ivy too. League bullshit is yeah, what it is okay. in general. And the fact is what they're trying to do there is brainwash the parents to bring up the children in a queer accessible environment so that the scripting into um, sex category never properly occurs. But that's a key milestone in development for children. And that's what they're hijacking. So I think that that's why it's so childhood. You have a receptive it's childhood oriented. You have a receptive audience. You have a necessity because adults are going to be like, yeah, no, I know who I am. No, thank you. And then you have um, this weird milieu of of leftist artist, activist, teachers, and and whatever that think that this is the message. We have to have representation. These kids need to feel seen by their teacher, by their society, by their art, by their media. By the... so let's just cram the weirdest stuff that we can in front of them. That taps into Paulo Freire's idea of a generative theme. Once the generative theme is there, the kid's asking questions, talking about it. The parents are usually not equipped to answer these questions. They are like, why is this in your cartoon in the first place? What's going on? You don't get to watch Blue's Clues anymore. Kids crying. And the queer theorists are the heroes of this. And the teachers are like, oh, well, we'll listen to you. And the whole cult dynamic just takes off. Two, two points to add to that, because I, I think you absolutely nailed it, James, is uh, the first one, they literally think they're racing against the clock. I mean, we write about that in the book. The cis heteronormative clock is about to strike midnight in their view, and they think society is brainwashing children to identify with their sex at birth and to grow up to be heterosexual. They think society is has a conditioning program that's scripting these children to turn out what's called cis heteronormative. So they're racing against it. They're They're very explicit about that. And the second point, um, that James, you've brought this up a number of times, but in the Drag Queen Story Hour paper, Drag drag Pedagogy and the Playful Practice of Imagination, or whatever the title Wait, is. Wait, is this, is this a joke paper or a real paper? No, this is this a real paper by Lil Miss We have to be Hot clear Mass. when James is on the yeah, stream that this wasn't yeah, something yeah, he Yeah, this is out. a little paper by Lil Miss Hotmas. And in that paper, they talk explicitly 
about how learning to read for children can be boring, it can be difficult, it can be tough, but Drag Queen Story Hour, learning how to read, which is is the mod of the argument, they're not learning how to read at all. Uh, learning how to read with a drag queen is dialed up. It, it's more fun, it's more colorful. The energy's there. It, 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 this is typical of all cults too. Uh, I don't know if either of you have seen the Netflix series about the big room yoga cult. But one thing cults do is they get you up and moving and chanting in tongues in some cases or dancing or in yoga, it's really easy. But they do this strategically so that you get what's uh, really an exercise high. So you get a runner's high. You're moving, you're breathing heavy, you get these endorphins released. And then the cult reinterprets that as some uh, form of new knowledge or new experience that's coming your way. They reinterpret that for you. And that's exactly precisely what they're doing with Drag Queen Story Hour. They're getting these kids so excited, so hyped up. I mean, the kids look terrified in many instances, but this is what they're trying to do. And they're explicit about it uh, so that they can initiate them into this cult. Uh, it's, it's really evil. It's, I mean, to know you're doing that. Uh, and that's kind of what set me off in this too. I've, I just read too many passages where academics are bragging in their academic journals about how the, their intent is to launch children into crisis. That's their intent. No learning can happen unless you are experiencing crisis. Before we hopped on, when I had those few extra minutes, I was rereading uh, a paper that we talk about in the book. Uh, it's actually a book called uh, Queering Critical Literacy and Numeracy for Social Justice. And this is a, a book that is, it, it's taking Freire's method uh, and applying it to reading exactly as Freire prescribed, but also for math. And it's just hilarious because the whole premise of the book, uh, the author is tying it uh, to an analogy of kayaking and how children can't be left to be in a kayak in stable water where they're comfortable. They need to be launched into rough waters, into white waters, and they need to experience instability. And you're reading this and you're just thinking, my God, these are the people educating children, yeah. the people who are saying we're bragging about their intent to launch your child into an emotional and psychological crisis in the classroom. This is brainwashing. Uh, it's that's precisely what it is. It's it's thought reform. It's launching them into the crisis so you can take advantage of it through what's called trauma bonding and reorient them in the way that you want them to go all the while making it seem as if they've come up with the way they want to go on their own. It's, it's really evil. Yeah. I've actually been um, working on this. Uh, I struck, I got struck by it the other day. It's like, okay, time to write my little book about Mao. <laughs> so I've been working on that. So I've been rereading Robert Lifton, for example, thought reform and the psychology of totalism, where the concept of thought reform, which he translates from the Chinese, that means um, ideological remolding is the technical Chinese term. Um, but that also relates to part of ideological remolding in the Chinese was literally what they called brainwashing. You have to wash the brain clean of the old bad ideas so you can you can remold them into the new good ideas. So that's why it's literally called this. So I'm reading this and he's got at the chapter 22 of that book is is just a gold mine. It's if you read this today, you'll think, oh my God, this guy is straight up describing, except when he mentions explicitly communists you'll and, and, and Chinese things, you'll think, wow, he's describing the woke environment we're in to a T. But this dude had no idea the woke environment. He was he published a book in 1961 based on research he did primarily in 1953 on Chinese uh, victims of the Cultural Revolution. Well, it's pre-Cultural Revolution of the Chinese Thought Reform Program. And so... Near the end in that chapter, he's talking about how one of the objectives of thought reform is to hold up this image that you can become this ideal, right? There's the ideal communist, the ideal whatever. In this case, it would be the ideal queer. And there's this image, but that image is not just unattainable. It's known by everybody involved to be unattainable. Mao himself, in his speech in 1957 that's so famous, the unhandling the contradictions among the people, um, says that he needs to continue to remold himself, otherwise he'll be left behind. So even Mao isn't there yet. It's a continual process for everybody. What Robin D'Angelo 
said about her anti-racist training is it's a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process of self-reflection, self-criticism, and social activism that puts it into practice and makes it real. And so you have this this milieu, but he says what this does is it gets people constantly not only chasing the ideal, but also simultaneously knowing they're not there. So they continually recommit, in this case, to wanting to be more queer or to 2024. I actually just read this, some weird social media thing somebody sent me, somebody's tweet or something was, in 2024, my New Year's resolution is to is to commit to becoming more gay. Like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> How do you become more gay? Like, you either are gay or not. Like, it's really not that complicated of a thing. But what that means is to be more actively, visibly, politically gay, to act, to perform gayness at a higher level, which is exactly what queer theory is saying, is that all of these yeah. things we think are probably have biological aspects in, in the case of biological, well, there's not even a word, in the case of sex, it is biological. There is no, there's no, dis, there's no biological sex versus some other kind. There's just sex, which is a biological phenomenon. And then the, we're going to perform that gender and sex performativity is the glowing contribution to the world that Judith Butler gave beyond the concept that everything that we do in life is drag, whether we know it or not. So that includes acting more gay in order to be more gay, to live up to a queer potential or whatever. And then, so I say all that just to say, and we quote this, um, I think this is Munoz, but I'm not positive who said this. Um, it's repeated throughout the queer theory literature that queer theory is a potential on a ever stretching horizon. We are not yet queer. We may never be queer, but we're heading toward queerness. And this sets up, according to Lifton, that cult milieu where not only are you being brainwashed, but you're committing yourself to your own brainwashing so that you feel like it's your own directedness, your own desire. Yeah. And that's exactly what Logan was describing. And then the horrifying part, though, is based off of this other book, <laughs> the kayak, which I think I read half of that kayak book. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the I can't talk about this book because it's so ridiculously stupid. And um <laughs> The idea, though, is like, well, the best way to get kids started on the quest of their queer horizon is to basically throw them in a boat right into a Category 5 rapid and, like, let them figure it out and then tell them that it went badly because of the cis-heteronormative society that constructed the rapids in the first place. And don't worry, we've got you. We know how to navigate the waters. And, by the way, it was your idea all along. So, But the point is that I wanted to make is Lifton describes exactly what, what Logan was just talking about as the thought reform milieu, specifically as an, in, an integral component of what characterizes the the ideological remolding that's his that's the actual Chinese for what gets translated as thought reform, the ideological remolding uh, environment. One of the Just... vectors of resistance to this is about the uh, well and, and and vectors of support, like ignorant support of this and vectors of, of direct attack on this in schools is through pornography or pornographic material showing up in our schools. And uh, that that does hijack that endorphin thing. So it would be a very powerful programming tool. And I did want to make an exception to uh, the grown men not thinking they can be women is uh, people who have uh, a preponderance of people who are addicted to pornography. Men who are addicted to pornography can end up with a trans identity in midlife. It can like unlock this like fixation on becoming a woman. Like instead of having a midlife crisis, buying a car and a new girlfriend, you become the, the girlfriend that you always wanted. So what is the role of pornography in this? Why is pornography or pornographic material, let's say, showing up in schools? Is, is there papers on this? Are they doing this explicitly? Or is this just a part? Is this just kind of an accidental addition to this tolerant permissiveness? So before Logan, I want Logan to answer this, but I want to just throw one thing on really quickly, because it is the Freudian um, generative method is what's going on. They're presenting them with something that causes shock, dissonance. Maybe the kid even likes it, right? Like maybe you got your eight-year-old and he sees boobs for the first time and he has his moment, right? You never know. <laughs> so uh, whatever, it doesn't matter whether the kid likes it or not. There's no apology for this, but the point is to create the generative thing. And so not to plug something separate to the book, but I've just got this documentary coming out and it turns out to fit perfectly here that's um beneath sheep's clothing and there's a scene in it with the 
if you know who he is, he studies education. He's very, very Christian. Alex Newman is talking about the surveys, the data collection process, and what's in the surveys is actually generative as well. The surveys that they're subjecting kids to under social emotional learning are contain generative themes. And he has it so perfectly. Like I picture this in my head, like a few times a week and just start laughing the way he delivers it. So everybody's got to see how he, I can't reproduce him, but he's talking about how, you know, they have these surveys. This isn't quite pornography, but it's very, very similar where it'll say, you know, the, and he says, these are for kids roughly age 10 to 12, um, at least in the research that he's presenting at that point. And it'll ask questions like how many sex partners have you had? Right. And so the, the choices will be zero, one or like one to three or whatever. But then the last one, maybe there's five different categories. I don't know, it's 20 plus. And he says what this does, as a, he doesn't use the term generative, but in, in the Freudian model, what this does is a generative theme is it plants the idea in the kid's head. Maybe that's normal. So the pornography, maybe that's normal. You're 12 or 10. You don't know, you don't have any basis for knowing what's normal. You're very probably private and weird. Your parents have probably not explored sex and sexuality with you at length at nine years old or 10 years old. So the way that Alex Newman delivers it, he was like, so 20 plus sex partners. And he immediately goes, well, what do you mean? They're 10. And so now you have 10 year olds wondering, maybe it's normal that I had 20 plus sex partners by the time I'm 10 years old. And I think that the pornography is largely um, connected to this. It's shocking. It Kids, as you can see, their faces with the drag queens, they know something's often, they know something's wrong. They know something's off. They are going to have to ask questions about it, but they also know it's shameful and they shouldn't ask their parents. Um, I remember watching like uh, Married with Children with my dad as a kid. It was like one of our things. And, yeah. you know, there's always the hot chicks acting kind of skanky on there or whatever is like a running theme. And I remember being so embarrassed when those scenes would come on. Like I couldn't even like look at my dad. I had to pretend like I didn't want my dad to notice that I noticed that there were hot chicks and tiny dresses on the screen, like acting, you know, luridly. And like, it was so weird, but that was the person, I, the last person on earth I wanted to talk about with it was my dad who was like right there. So I think that the introduction of this material creates a generative opportunity to start having those conversations with a trusted adult who's not your parent because your parent has that, you know, constant kind of right and wrong judgmental vibe okay. and is supposed to. And therefore, you know, this other trusted adult might not. So I think that the vector of attack here is literally to shock into the generative theme, to cause the cognitive and emotional stress, to a approach somebody with an age inappropriate thing that they kind of know is wrong and inappropriate, maybe dirty, whatever words they use for it. And that they then have to resolve that stress yet again in the, in conjunction with somebody who can lead them the, to the, to the correct interpretation of the crisis that they've been put into, which if I remember right um, from the, and it's been a minute since I've looked at it, if the, the, is that part in the book by Kevin Kumashiro? Um, yeah. The identity crisis guys by this guy, Kevin Kumashiro, a queer educator. And what he says is that the point of the facilitator or the educator is to make sure that the children once pushed into this crisis can resolve the crisis productively. And it's like productively according to whom, Kevin? Like, what are you doing? Those are kids. Um, so I think that that's actually the primary purpose of this, uh, to be honest with you. But um, by all means, Logan. Yeah, just a couple of points. I completely agree. Um, you asked, <clears throat> is this happening by mistake? It certainly is not. Uh, I, everything that queer activists do is intentional and there's purpose behind it. Um, the, the porn in schools is not a mistake. It really stems from the idea, because mo most people look at this, uh, and if they know anything about this, they think, my God, you can't have pornographic materials in front of eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds. It's completely developmentally inappropriate to present those materials to young children who might not even have any clue what, what sex is at all. Um, they're just not there. And they do this intentionally because they are they are quite literally explicitly trying to break the idea of childhood innocence the one thing that protects uh children from porn in schools is the idea that there's a normal developmental track for children it's it, it you can't have that in there children are susceptible to all all sorts of uh, manipulations when when that sort of thing is introduced to them 
uh, and you, you can't do it. So what queer theory does is it targets the idea of childhood innocence. That's the thing we come through and say, you can't put porn in schools. Children are innocent. They're not ready to handle that sort of thing. Uh, that those are discussions, sexual discussions to be had with their parents, uh, who are the sole up determiners of their upbringing can decide what's appropriate for that child. Uh, so queer theory targets childhood innocence by bombarding innocent children with things uh, that break their innocence so they can be remolded in a different way. Queer mm -hmm. theory literally thinks that the idea of an innocent child is a social construct. It's something that the cis heteronormative society uses and constructs to protect children from seeing things like porn, things that might introduce them to a different queer way of life that they could explore. So the the porn, yeah. the those books in school are very intentional. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they use a leverage on that by saying with the childhood innocence, which they're deliberately attacking exactly like Logan said, there's another point of leverage they use with that, which is to say, well, not a, it's not fair. Not every kid. Some kids get molested. Some kids have rough home lives. Some some kids, you know, are not in a in a nurturing environment. This you see this again and again and again in the SEL literature for why we need SEL. Well, some kids have great home lives and they don't need social emotional upbringing in the schools, but not everybody. So here, what they say is that not all kids are are privileged enough to have an innocent upbringing. So their solution is the usual equity equalizes downward. If everybody can't have an innocent upbringing, nobody gets an innocent upbringing. We're oh, gonna wow. go. Yeah. De-innocentize, or we're going to go, the word for de-innocentizing in their literature is initiate, literally, in case oh. you wondered if it's a cult. We're going to initiate them into these themes, these ideas, this uh, other way of considering life. And I think that, like Logan said, it's extremely intentional, and they have all of these myriad justifications for why they're doing it. But the ultimate objective is this destruction of innocence into initiation so that they can... Uh, Take So what is, what is child innocence about? This is what they want to take apart. Child and innocence is in a sense, we could, I don't think it's a mythology, but we could construe it as a broad social mythology, sort of like they do, that is designed to keep children within developmentally appropriate boundaries. And they want the children taken out of developmentally appropriate boundaries to the point where they write entire academic papers suggesting that childhood development psychology itself needs to be queered because it, it's, it in turn is reinforcing cis heteronormativity and therefore needs to be uh, undone. It's not taking queer perspectives into account, blah, 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 the whole usual leverage points. And so they want – I don't think the innocence for children – is a mythology. I think it's based in reality. And that reality is that to be, to develop in a healthy way, there are boundaries around adult themes and adult topics that they are not ready to um, conceptualize. And in particular, they're not ready to emotionally engage with. Um, the, the seat Without of help. many of the personality yeah. disorders is that adult emotional and other types of interaction are introduced to a child too early who isn't emotionally capable. They haven't developed far enough to be able to do it. So childhood innocence is this this concept based on the reality that children need to be kept within a bit of a bubble to mature emotionally and psychologically to the point where they are actually able to start metabolizing uh, adult themes and adult content, which includes sex and sexuality, probably um, above and beyond anything. What's really funny now, though, that we mentioned it just to real quick aside, when I was in sixth grade, I had to take my first sex ed class. It never struck me. So we had this horrifying nurse. We all joked at the time, like we were all laughing that they gave us this really ugly nurse who came in. And the first thing she said is, I love sex. And all the boys were like, ew, oh my God, no. It's like, it's not like some, it's not like the nurse on the cover of the Blink-182 album or whatever it was. It's like yuck nurse saying she loves sex. But one of the activities we had to do was we all had to go out and they said, how many sex partners have you had? We're going to do a survey. And the way that we did it was that we went out in the hall and there was a box full of beads of different colors. And if the answer was zero, we put a blue bead. And if the answer was one, we put a green bead. And if the answer was like two to five, we put a yellow bead and on up. And then I forget what the highest number was, but that was like the black bead or the purple bead or something really, you know, intense color, like on the, on the weather map. And, uh, then they reported, they didn't tell what anybody's beads were, but then they reported the, um, results. And of course, and if this was manipulative, I don't know, but of course, some little shit sixth graders are little trolls 
and grabbed the black bead and threw them in there anyway. So there's like, we're like 12 or 11, 11, I think. And then the, the chart comes back and it's like almost all blue, maybe a green, a little bit in between. And then there's like this repository of like purple or black or both where it's like, you know, not ever, not a ton of them, but like 12, 14 out of the, not out of the pile of like 300 kids or 200 kids that were across the whole grade. And, um, we were all like, whoa, you know, thinking some of the kids in our grade were going and just like getting it done every which way. <laughs> and take that and make, the, whether that was deliberate or not, I don't know, but take that and make that extraordinarily intentional to break the image of childhood innocence to make some of the kids feel like, man, I'm like, must be nerdy. I must be behind the kind of stuff that they're going to grapple with usually at like junior, senior year as to whether or not they've been on a date or kiss yeah. somebody for the first time yet. Um, now it's like being thrust down on junior high uh, and very intentionally so in order to to destroy childhood innocence, but not just this cute little, I mean, not to apologize if that was like really manipulative, I don't want to like defend it, but it felt like, well, this is just what sex ed is. You know, we didn't know any different and that's kind of the point, but this is a very deliberate attempt to introduce not little beads and anonymous survey, blah, yeah. blah, blah, but deliberately in a public class environment, highly sexualized material, and then to initiate a, dis a highly uncomfortable discussion around it, um, and then to use the social and emotional learning tools that they've now installed everywhere, they say, oh my gosh, look at all of this distress that the kids are under. We need social emotional learning to manage their distress. That's to channel it productively, which is is to push them further into these these circumstances, which is it, it, and just undermine innocence entirely. It's just really kind of awful awful to to consider that so much of this is being done this intentionally what's what's uh fascinating about it is that it's a liberatory ideology a lot of these things are very highly individualistic seeming especially you can be whatever you want you can be whoever you want it's your choice nobody can tell you but in practice when it when the rubber meets the road they're attacking uh normativity because they, they want everybody to be free from normativity. They want to liberate the child. And what they end up doing is um, antagonizing the parents or casting the parents as the enemy of the child. And, and they need to somehow protect. That's one of their leverage points. We need to protect the children from these ignorant parents. What that does is that when it gets to the state level, what we saw in California last year is that California is explicitly, the Attorney General of California is explicitly going after parents' rights. They want the state itself, so this huge collective, the most centralized power, the least individualistic thing, the, the thing that, that actually can't look at people as individuals, but rather just markers on, on a board uh, that they're shuffling around, they're the ones who have the biggest advantage in this, the state, the collective. And, and of course, the state's going to adopt an ideology. I think just naturally it's going to adopt an ideology that helps it perform its role of, you know, taking care of and intruding on every, every uh, relationship, um, especially the parent relationship. Could you guys talk a little bit about the effect that the, these ideas have on the family and on the relationship between the parent and the child? Well, I'm going to let Logan take most of this. I just want to add one point again from Lifton since I have my head's buried in it. Um, Lifton is very clear because you say, you know, they, they say it's liberatory, but obviously in some weird way it's not because normativity becomes completely illegal. Like, so you're not liberated to be whoever you want. You're liberated to not be normal, right? And if you want to be normal, puff. What Lifton describes it as is he says that the thought reform or the ideological remolding environment creates it claims to be liber liberation in, in action, but what it actually produces is a very, and this is a close, I'm paraphrasing very closely, a very narrow window of experience that's rooted in guilt and shame. And so what it does is it creates a very narrow um, interpretive range for who you're allowed to be that's all rooted in powerful emotions that are extremely primal to being human is a long, surprisingly long discussion of how innate guilt and shame are to every human and how these get manipulated. And so when you say that, you know, you're liberated, it, it, people should know what that means. What you're being liberated from is normativity. What that means is normativity is bad. So you can't go back to normativity. And it's not just the people who become queer, who are becoming traitors to go back to it. Nobody's allowed to be in the realm of normativity because that would reinscribe normativity 
And of course, because it's actually legitimately normal, what that it's going to be a very desirable state. It's like the ground state. People are actually going to want to be normal predominantly. And so that becomes taboo. And then the desire, Lifton's very clear about this too, the desire to live up to the queer standard while internally you feel as though, you know, maybe I'm a little more normal than I think, creates a guilt and shame spiral within you that he said compels you into this weird twisted environment that he calls the pair cults, the cult of confession and the cult of enthusiasm. And by enthusiasm, he means yes. religious zeal. He says that explicitly, so I'm not rifting, uh, riffing off of him. He says it literally by enthusiasm. He means like the religious ecstasy feeling, you know, like they say, you know, queer euphoria or whatever, trans euphoria. So the idea is you're constantly guilty and shame filled because you're not allowed to want to live more normally than you are. And so what you do is you enter into a weird system of confession for all of your cis normative crimes, push yourself further along and feel utterly shame ridden that you have those feelings in the first place, which you then project outward onto enemies uh, and punish them in advance. And it becomes a very toxic stew. But he says that's utterly characteristic of the thought reform milieu. Um, so just to Point that out, and I'll let Logan talk about the family aspect because um, it's personally closer to him, I think, with young kids. Yeah. The, um, I mean, what you were just talking about, James, the symbolic surrender, confessing so that you you can remove your individualism and, you know, just kind of float into the masses, into the collective and fit in. It, It's really bad. I want to sp uh, speak specifically to the point you made, uh, Benjamin, about attacking parental rights, like people need to understand how much queer activists think about subverting parental rights. They write paper after paper, page after page, thousands of pages across books and dissertations about attacking parental rights. And one of the ones uh, papers we include in the book is called Navigating Parental Resistance. And in this paper, a couple of teachers talk specifically, uh, they brag about it, about how they're fooling parents into thinking what they're doing in their classroom is not happening. One of the things they uh, they speak to is, well, cons parents come to us concerned that we're going to be talking about LGBTQ plus issues in class, which of course they're not they're not going to be talking about happening to be gay or happening to be lesbian in class. Uh, that's not what they're doing. They're they're using queer pedagogy to initiate children into the cult. But when parents come to them concerned, these authors say, well, we just hide behind our state standards. We just talk about, well, we've got an, an ESL standard we've got to follow. And this just happens to be the issue we're talking about to get to the ESL. Look at this assignment we gave them. It's about vocabulary. And they brag about the fact that parents read this and they think to themselves, well, this is padable. Uh, I'm kind of against the things they're talking about, but I can get through it because look how much they're focusing on reading. When, of course, that isn't the goal at all. They're, they're learning how to read queerly, not learning how to read it as you or I would understand it. Huh. Um, in, in throughout the paper, uh, they talk about this. They talk about using code words to fool parents so that they're using words in a double meaning. Uh, this is often said that, uh, they share your language, but they share your, they don't share your dictionary. So they'll talk to parents and say one thing, like we're just teaching inclusively to mask what's really going on. And again, they couldn't be more explicit about it. Uh, I hope people enjoy that section in the book because we re really detail it, use their own words to show that there's a lot of thought that goes into this. This isn't happening uh, by accident. It's not a few bad apples. Teachers across the country are learning in their education schools to do this. There's technical terms for the things they're doing to subvert parental rights. And where does it? Where does this lead? Then? Like, like ultimately, if you just if you just play this out, like, where does this lead? Where where does these queer where do these queer schools? What kind of uh, citizen do they eventually produce? You want to jump on that one? I mean, yeah. Lifton's not optimistic about where it, what it creates. Um, I may actually see if I can quickly pull up what his exact phrase is, where he summarizes the effect of ideological totalism. It turns out I was actually on that page from where I left off reading it last night. Um, he said, in combination, this creates an atmosphere where, uh, which may temporarily, temporarily energize or exhilarate. In other words, there's your queer euphoria, right? But which at the same time poses the gravest of human threats. 
Like he doesn't mince words about how actually bad this is. Um, so what it creates is is broken, radicalized citizens who have learned to externalize the lack of satisfaction of their needs onto society. It's not that they are um, making the wrong moves or acting in a way that's that's you know unpalatable or whatever that's causing them to lack success. It's that society hates people like them. And therefore, what this transforms into, and this is the the terminology of the the character Theo Jordan. I don't know if you've spoken with him, Benjamin, but he's pretty good. He's on Twitter. He calls yeah, yeah. this hate craft. And uh, what it does is it teaches them to externalize the blame, scapegoat certain types of people, and to hate the people who are making their lives not work. And reality is that their life isn't working because they're failing, but the people who made their lives not work are the people who brainwashed them into the dysfunctional cult in the first okay. place. So you have you know a person over here who's brainwashed the target who then blames society over here for yeah. their failure. And um, they use this land of rainbows, of like they paint this imaginary land of rainbows and goodness and inclusivity that's actually impossible. And it's all everybody else's fault that this is impossible. So they, they promise a false bill of goods. And then that radicalizes or deeply uh, it embeds a deep sense of resentment in the subject. In the right. And these people isolate from people who might tell them otherwise. So they, they become increasingly isolated, which increases the pressures yep. and cult milieu and dis dissatisfaction and resentment and envy. And meanwhile, it's tearing apart families. It's tearing apart communities. It's tearing apart school classrooms or environments because everything's contentious. The personal is political. Nothing can be put away. Um, and their goal becomes to either take over things and run them into the ground, according to their cult dictates, or to destroy the things that aren't giving in to their they're uh, absolutely intractable demands. And so they become uh, zealots in a militant ideology that has no exit ramp, um, which is an incredibly dangerous thing, especially when the repository of the people who are going to hit that degree of this are going to be late teens and early 20s primarily. Um, yeah. You're going to have this very angry young person base that is now completely radicalized against society who has no way out of this. So it only takes the right charismatic situ you know, leader or situation, influencer or whatever to start pushing them, tipping them toward the, you know, it's time for revolution. And the next yeah. thing you know, they'll they'll get told maybe something like, well, what's just happened in Israel with Gaza, that means that this is revolution. And now you have queers for Palestine marching the streets because the yes. issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. And these people just want society to fail. And they see yeah. something that's challenging the hegemony of society and boom, they're all in queers for Palestine. So I guess that they can get their way and get thrown off of a roof. I have no idea what they envision here. Um, but, you know, liberation of one is liberation is a step toward liberation for all. Uh, and that's the that's the kind of citizens you end up with nonsensical, angry, resentful, trapped people. They're, it's a pitiful situation who are self-loathing with no exit ramp. There's. There's two points I want to make to to build off of that. I mean, the the idea that there is no positive vision at the end of this is core to the ideology. Uh, the world that they're selling to kids can only be described negatively. There is no pot of positive vision at the end of the rainbow. It is only dissolve, pour acid on things, tear things apart, keep complaining, uh, and eventually we'll get, if we keep peeling away at the layers of the onion we don't know what's at the center of it but eventually we'll get there so when it takes advantages of kids who might be having a bad time in life and promises them this beautiful end of the rainbow those those children are never going to get there it only knows dissolution that's one point the second point is uh, where this goes and what i worry about uh, is there, most people still don't understand what's going on. They have no clue what the queer theory is, how it developed, where it came from. They know there's a bunch of weird stuff happening in the schools and they're thinking, how the hell did this happen? The school wasn't like this when, when I went to school 30 years ago. And because they don't understand it, uh, they're stepping into a situation um, where they're 
they've got so much pent up, built up energy. They just want it to end. I, I mean, I talk to a lot of people who are thinking, I don't know what the hell's going on, but it needs to stop. And I keep hearing that from more and more and more people that, that don't understand it, which is very important to not step in traps and do what queer activists want you to do. And there's a lot of pent up energy. And I worry about uh, those people being manipulated to do certain things to stop what's happening. Um, so I worry about it from both sides. Sometimes so there's like a, there's a path, there's a path, there's a path towards resolution that doesn't involve, uh, I don't know, Christo fascism, the very thing that they're, <laughs> they're already planting seeds against. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out an example of what you're seeing. Like what, where, where's the wrong way to go? Like what's the, what's the positive vision for resistance? No, the wrong way to go is like, it needs to stop. So I'm going to show up with a gun and make sure it stops. That's yeah. the wrong way to go. Yeah. Um, the right way to go is perhaps because we do not have the institutional power, we need to divest from the system that's doing this. We need to protect our kids completely. We need to pull our kids out of the schools and let the bottom drop out so far that the question starts having to be asked, what in the world is going on and how do we make it how do we make it stop through, you know, legal and civil means rather than somebody getting so desperate or so angry about what's happening to their children that they that that they pop off and do something ridiculous. We're actually in a fairly um, advantaged point, not institutionally against queer theory. The culture has moved vastly away from it. And the primary reason is that the per the first group of people who actually did visible national news, unavoidable, reflexive environment level violence was a trans person in a school in Nashville, Tennessee, which completely changed the entire nature of the provocation, changed the complete energy of the pride last year fell on its face. And I think it's maybe because people got sick of it, but it's 90, if I had to guess 90% because a trans shooter was the first person who did who did the the reactionary thing and took it across the line and lost all of the public goodwill. If I had to guess, that it, I mean, well, I work really hard to maybe have a contribution to the 10%, yeah. but the goal is to produce people um, who are going to go flip out and make that huge violent event point the other direction. Um, it's, it's very coincidental that that shooter's manifesto never showed up. They, they didn't want to, I don't know why the system wouldn't want to publish that. But it eventually mm -hmm. did show up, and it was uh, radical liberatory. You know, it was, it was that inverse racism. It was just like we need yep. to. I need to go there and destroy normativity. Then you have people like Lamar Burton. Uh, is that yeah, Lavar, Lavar, and uh, Joy Reid. Who Joy oh. Reid, uh, the Reading Rainbow guy, who said that yeah. we should basically did a. I'm glad I don't have to punch any women because Moms for Liberty isn't here. And Joy Reid, who uh, was. I don't think intentionally, but she was by Tiffany Justice made to kind of cornered and then um, justified or apologized for or, or defended uh, pedophilia, ped pornographic material in schools. So there's a class of media or class of, of the good liberal, a class of the good left, the democratic left, the ones who are fighting against fascism by um, and fighting for democracy by trying to uh, get certain people that they don't want off the ballot. They are they're the standard bearers for the queer theory. Do they really understand that? Or is it built in that they would, is it built into at this point, the Democrat broadly construed uh, set of ideals that inclusivity like they are always they're always uh they're, they're doing all that bailying for yeah. the modders right i think it's mostly the latter it's conservatives are bad anything conservatives are against must be good defend 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 circle wagons whatever the wagon just say what you have to say to get through it okay that's okay. joy reed right there yeah and is there is part of this uh, in your work either of your work to depoliticize this to say this isn't a left versus right red versus blue thing this is a parent uh, and child parent for children thing. Um, is that, is that part of, uh, the work of, uh, what you guys are, are doing or am I? I mean, I feel like that's a, a very consistent theme, especially in my work with Moms for Liberty pushes that issue, um, that, that angle very strongly. Um, it's certainly impossible to re read this book and not come away thinking that that's where our head is. Like, this is just normal. Uh, the book is framed out is that we're going to allow normal kids to have normal lives. Uh, and so it's just normalcy. It, it's, it's like an unapologetic uh, defense of normal. 
uh, really. And normal normal has nothing to do with what side of a political divide you're on, especially at the party level. Okay. Yeah, and I but, have, um, you know, in my social circles, it, it, there's a lot of people who, with advanced degrees, it doesn't matter the, their level of education, are completely mystified, who they hear things like diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they think those things must be good. I mean, they're thought-terminating cliches. You hear them, and it's like, well, who could possibly be against that? And so I approached the book and my work by saying, listen, a lot of the things you've been taught um, about what these words mean and these concept means are are being weaponized against you. They don't mean these things. And here are dozens and dozens and dozens of examples from the literature of people saying, hey, this is not what we mean when we use the term inclusion. Uh, so th this really is a book for everyone. Uh, it doesn't matter what your politics are. If you want to live in a stable, normal world and you want some normalcy to return to your life and you want your children to grow up in a world where they can just be normal, healthy kids, whatever that means for them. Um, I think it's, it's a great read. Yeah. And how do you, how do you wrap it up? Are there action uh, items on there or um, like a path to understanding once people, let's just assume that people get a really good grasp of queer theory, how it's operating in schools. Like what, what are they to do with that information? Uh, ideally everyone would be set up to homeschool, <laughs> homeschool their children, uh, to James's point, until the bottom drops out and people start behaving normally. Um, but I, I, I completely understand that's that's not something every parent can do. And for whatever reason, if you can't homeschool because there's millions of people doing it now, you can get uh, so many of them are generous and will completely walk you through what that looks like, what that means, talk to you about how they arrange their finances, how they're handling it. But if you can't do that at bare minimum, you have to develop an ironclad relationship with your children. You have to talk to them. You have to know what's going on in their life. You have to talk to them about school. And on top of that, you need to understand, you don't have to go and read like uh, James does, or I do all of this literature, but at a bare minimum, you have to understand something is going very wrong. Your children are being psychologically abused or someone's attempting to do it. And you need to protect them and inoculate from that, them from that. Talk to them about what might happen in school and how they might handle that or what has happened and how they handled it. Uh, it's possible. I know in that, <laughs> that book, I'm going to bring it up again, Queering Literacy and Numeracy for Social Justice. I laughed for about an hour straight because the author is just wailing about the fact that a fifth grade boy and a sixth grade boy are not doing the assignment that she assigned. The assignment was... It, it, remember, this is a this is for a math class. the The students are assigned one of several articles that they need to go and read about some social injustice uh, against some group of people and come back and make a math problem out of that. But she says herself, the, the goal of the assignment is not math at all. It's it's learning how to handle social injustice and be an activist. But these kids won't do it. They're just researching turtles on the computer. Like it's, <laughs> I don't know if their parents talk to them or if the kids are just smart, but she goes page after page after page. And then there's a little break and six page later, six pages later, she comes back to it. And she says, these kids won't stop researching turtles and snakes. They're supposed to be researching social justice topics so they can make their math question. And they just refuse. And when I was reading that, I was just laughing uh -huh. so hard. That's who you want your kid to be, to say to hell with this. I'm going to write my essay about turtles or snakes. I'm not going and reading a medical essay that you've you selected for a very specific purpose about some sort of discrimination in my math class. I'm going to go read about turtles and, and maybe study the population distribution. I'm going to do my own thing. Having yeah. a kid like that, they're brilliant and they're going to go far in the world if things don't change uh, radically yeah. as they yeah. are now. So just to, I guess to tie things off and thanks for your time and sorry that this started late, but um James, you brought up that that the part of the problem was that conservatives divested from art, and they said art is gay. Or it, but if they do that the same way with education, won't that only leave the worst of the worst in the educa education system? Is divestment if, if divestment divest allowed it to come in? 
Will divestment allow it the bottom to actually fall? No, out, because these just... are different domains. We divested from the professional space. We're not saying that people should divest from the professional space in education. In fact, if they're pulling their kids out of schools, we're taking the kids out of the environment, which is the justification for federal and state money for you know keeping the school open, for asking questions or thinking everything's you know a okay, so we don't have to ask questions. You take the kids out. The parents are actually learning to be educators because they're homeschooling. They're working homeschooling pods and. So you're in a very organic sense starting to build the alternative um, educational system. So it's it's two different domains. So no, I'm not saying, okay. you know what, that's it. Abandon education. Conservatives don't become teachers. I'm saying, no, get the kids out of the schools to bottom out the way that the system is organized from a kind of a financial and structural situation to force there to be uh, open dialogue about the problems in the schools, this restorative justice and so on. Um, and then... At the same time, the parents, by taking up homeschooling, are going to eventually start to do what everybody does when they're all doing something, is start to find efficiencies of scale by creating new school environments that uh, actually completely buck this existing system, rather than trying to kind of come in from above with a big you know, billionaire donor and build out like, oh, here's the new school model everybody's going to be on. You know, By the way, it's on a huge grant from Walmart. Uh, you know, we're we're now actually building out the alternative education situation to where where are the teachers supposed to come from? Well, if you've got people that have all this homeschooling and small pod schooling and commu collective uh, schooling in neighborhood schools, whatever they're called, environment, and you deregulate, well, you know, maybe our teachers having college degrees was part of the problem. So let's open up teacher certification uh, to a broader pool. You've got tons of people who are normal people with experience now who are your ideal um, talent pool to start drawing from. So you're generating the talent pool for the alternative at the same time as you're bottoming out the corrupt market, uh, and, but doing so in a realistic, organic way that is you know, solving multiple problems at once instead of some very artificial thing where you create like the Benjamin Boyce school for, for boys or whatever, and let's say it's perfect and great, which means the woke hate it, which means it's you know, every tiny infraction, everything is New York Times front page until they bury you. Yeah. They can't they're gonna have a hard time burying a disaggregated movement of homeschoolers across tens of millions of parents. Um it, it, so it's a complete it's 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 a different call for divestment. It's like customer divestment rather than uh, professional divestment. Okay. All right. Thanks for your clarification. Um, the Queering of the American Child is number one in queer theory on Amazon. As, as Gay studies, expect. technically. Gay studies, okay. Yeah. Um, do you commit to being more based this year, guys, or is that just um, performativity? How in the world do I become more based, Benjamin? <laughs> <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, just Logan, tell the truth and you're already based. That's really what it comes down right. to. Stand yeah. up for the truth. Stand up for normalcy. You're already based. There's not becoming more based. Just have the courage to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Logan, it's been, you've been a, a wonderful follow all these years. So thanks. Thanks very much. It's, it's great to meet you in this milieu. And I, uh, I know you guys, your book's going to do really well. Do you guys have uh, like what's going on next for either of you, James? I know you always have something in the pot, but Logan, do you have another... Uh, book or is this going to, you yeah. think you foresee this as a part of a series of what you've been working on because you're very thematic in, in your Twitter. Yeah, usage. I think, I think the next thing I'm going to tackle and I've been researching in the next few months, I'll really ramp up is on restorative justice, uh, kind of tackled. I mean, James did so brilliantly critical race theory, uh, got the word out. We're hoping that this does the same for queer theory. And the next big thing is, for, for me, I think, is restorative justice, because that is in absolutely every school that I look into, from the smallest rural communities uh, to the most elite private institutions. And no one has any idea what the hell it's about. They're just looking at their schools descended to chaos. They just know that when that system is implemented, uh, everything becomes disorder and there's student fights and there's sexual harassment against teachers and no one can be disciplined and problem students are kept in the school and no learning happens and people are going, where the heck did this come from? What is this? So that's the uh, next huh. theme I'm going to approach. Why does everything this ideology touch turn to shit? <laughs> 
Well, Trump told us everything woke goes to shit. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> no, because it, it's an inversion of reality, Benjamin. That's actually the short answer is when you force people to conform to an inversion of reality and then turns out no matter what you do ideologically, they live in reality. There's one and only one outcome, which is eventually everything goes to shit. Yeah. Yay. Right. Uh, James, uh, do you have another thing to plug? You got something coming up here? Or you, I, I mean, you're... I've always got something. I started, yeah. uh, I did the whole thing where I looked myself in the mirror and asked myself, do I really believe the world's like at this much risk of a cultural revolution? Yes. So am I doing everything I can? No. And so time to fight less on social media and get buckled down. I've got this book I've kind of had floating around. It started to coalesce that I wanted to write about Mao. I kind of finally figured out the way I wanted to go at it. Had a little writer's block, false start. Then writer's block broke, damn broke, wrote 50,000 words this week. So um, we're way off to the races um, wow. in terms of this. Yeah. And so be careful it turns out carpals, dude, you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> well, some of them are actually, my wrist is a little bit sore from the weird angle, like using my laptop, but um, the, a, uh, the book is actually blowing me away. I'm stressing myself out with how tight it fits. And then I got like through all of the kind of stuff I thought I wanted to say, and then I wanted to deal with the education part and I didn't know what I'd do with it. And then at the end, I have some stuff I want to get to um, about how uh, it, how the model is going to lead, where it's going to lead in the future. But I started doing the education thing and it's like I had a chapter set aside for education and now it's three chapters because it's like there's yeah. no way to summarize the relevance and importance and yeah. depth of what's going wrong in education. And the fact that you can actually, with very shockingly little effort, draw straight lines back to the programs that Mao Zedong implemented, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, yeah. uh, in his society and schools and workplaces and prisons. Is uh, that organic, you think? It just kind of fits into the woke doctrines and stuff? That the Maoist well, what I've, what I've, the or? case I try to make is that... Um, the people who architected the critical theory system that has implemented throughout the West, critical pedagogy in particular with Paulo Freire, but also the Marcusians and so on, were explicitly Maoists. They were people who studied what Mao did, said, wow, that worked. Let's do it here. And um, it's not actually that hard to make the historical case. I don't actually mention this anywhere in this book so far because I haven't found the hard confirmation of it. But I've heard it from a number of people, including some of the researchers at Heritage Foundation, that, for example, the joke – so Kimberly Crenshaw with uh, you know CRT, they wrote this anthology called Critical Race Theory, the Key Writings that Form the Movement you know, in, in the 90s or some early 2000s, a long time ago. It's this gigantic book, and it turns out it's read. What a big surprise. And they, amongst themselves, the contributors, refer to it as the Big Red Book because they're – paying homage to Mao because they're actually Maoists. But what you can actually find with like an intersectionality, it's it's actually not hard to prove like definitively that the members of the Combahee River Collective saw themselves as Maoist instigators, that their philosophy intrinsically was Maoist. It's not hard to go back and show that in the 1960s, the radicals that were in the Marxist vein that supported Herbert Marcuse, their chant was Marx, Mao, Marcuse. Mao was yeah. their guy. It's not hard to see that the liberationist theme, like Mao named his army, the People's Liberation Army, for a reason. It's the same concept, the same methodology. The liberationist movements actually followed Mao's lead yeah. in terms of how to implement a insurgency with mostly peasants and then students, which were his two primary uh, radical bases. And so it's just like the evidence just piles up that this was – whether it's intentional, like, let's bring Mao in, that's not really the question. It's, were the people that designed what we're going through Maoists? Yes. Were they inspired by Mao and how his success was? Yes. Does their system that they devised match in a shockingly almost one-to-one -one correspondence with what Mao was able to do in China from 1949 to 1976? Yes. Uh, unquestionably. Um, and so I've decided for a long—I mean, I've been giving— public talks about this for a year and a half, I figured maybe I should finally write something down. Uh, and like I said, once I started, it just started to pour out of me. Um, it's, it's it's overwhelming. I thought that the chapters would be a couple thousand words each and just have this short guide. And like the shortest one so far is like 8,500. And I'm like, I really <laughs> didn't cover it. Like, I'm scared when I go through and edit this thing because it's going to get longer because I'm going to think know. of more evidence yeah. and more things to add. 
especially drawing off a of Lifton, which now I've reread almost the entirety of Lifton again. And it's like, oh my God, got to include that. Got to include that. Got to include It's going to be a million words. And I know so, uh, like at Portland State University, and this is just kind of like a coincidence that I've noticed, but at Portland State University, there's an entire floor of one of their buildings that's all Chinese studies and nobody kind of knows what goes on in there. I know you have to know that China has spent a lot of money um, boosting up the ideas that that align with it and and i'm i don't know if there's like a direct well, correlation that's a, com a conversation about the asia society and the chan family that we should probably not have too publicly yet okay <laughs> there we go but yeah. yes yeah well thank you both i'm gonna end the recording you guys are wonderful great to meet you logan james thanks for your time um and uh your guys this book will be linked in the description it is an excellent read and uh it's gonna be very useful especially to parents who who need a little uh to to understand it who want to who want a little bit more uh, uh legs to stand on when they uh want to put their foot down and uh because it is a very uh chaotic sea that's being created in, in schools intentionally from from what you guys have said to us today so. yeah thanks for having me on uh i i told uh, James this, Benjamin, but one of the things that radicalized me was uh, the events of Evergreen. I mean, it was w what a disaster and your work has been incredible in that area. I mean, I'll never forget watching some of the video for the first time and seeing George Bridges ask if he can go to the bathroom and the students just say, no, hold it. And I remember yeah. thinking, my God, what is going on? And that's one of the things that kind of launched me down this road. So it was great to meet you and thanks for having me on. All right. All right. Good, 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 good.